gonna dive in here and um, we're excited. We're in our Behind the Scenes series and we've been walking through the book of Esther. And I don't know about you, but this feels like the biggest action movie like that we're watching play out, right? Um, kind of right before our eyes. Esther is a, a Jew and she gets called to the palace. Her uncle Mordecai has kind of raised her up. Uh, she becomes queen and all of a sudden this man named Haman comes on the scene and uh, he hates her people and he wants to wipe out the Jews. He hates her uncle, Mordecai, and uh, he, wants to, he wants to get rid of all of them. And the king doesn't really know that Esther is a Jew and that means that she would be a part of that group. And in chapter four, Pastor Trent a couple weeks ago talked about how uh, Esther was faced with a decision whether she was going to go before the king on behalf of her people or whether she was going to stand by. And uh, the Lord assured her that if she, didn't, if she didn't do it, help was going to come from another place. But he had called her and he put her in the palace. And now we get to chapter five where uh, she gets to put her faith into action. A couple weeks ago, as Pastor Trent was preaching through chapter four, he, he ended his time talking about how Esther, before she went to the king, she rallied all the Jews together and she asked them to pray and to fast. And she said, before I go to the king, I want you to pray and fast. And so everybody came together. And Pastor Trent talked about how we can be rest assured that when we set aside time and devote ourselves to prayer and fasting, we can expect God to move, right? And so Esther had, had asked her people to pray and to fast, and now those three days were up and it was go time. If Esther believed that prayer and fasting were effective, she was about to put her faith into action and, and really test the Lord in her obedience and see if, if this was actually going to work. One of the things that's interesting about the book of Esther is that the name of God is actually never mentioned. But commentaries uh, suggest that that was a deliberate literary device that was taken uh, to highlight the fact that God is always working in the seemingly coincidental moments of our lives. All of those moments that we think, man, that's just our luck and it's just a coincidence, is the Lord working behind the scenes. And so while we don't read the name of God, one of the most powerful things about this book is we see evidence of the presence of God in every single part. And so Esther has rallied her people to pray and now it's time for her to act. And, and a question that I wanna ask us that we're gonna be going back to throughout our message today is this, what part do I have to play in God's mission for my life? How can I actively participate in God's plan for my life? And we see Esther respond to this. We're gonna jump into chapter five if you have your Bibles. We're gonna hit verse one through three and go through it together. It says this, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace. In front of the king's hall, the king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom, I will give you. So I wanna walk through this moment. It starts with Esther getting dressed for the occasion, right? She puts on her royal robes. These royal robes would have been a, a Phoenician purple color and they would have been embroidered in gold and her undergarments would have been white and purple under her robe. And uh, we believe that the reason why she dressed this way was because it was a formal occasion. She was gonna go before the king. And she wanted to symbolize and remind the king that she was his royal counterpart, right? She was the queen and they were together, they were married. And so she dressed for the job and the task at hand. I have a friend that has said to me multiple times and it's kind of a mantra in her own life. And she says this, dress for the day that you want to have. And I don't know about you, but if I get ready in the morning and I, and I get my hair done and I feel good, I, it changes my day versus when I stay in my pajamas and sweats all day and have my hair up, right? You, you kind of feel like a slob when you don't get ready for the day. I remember a few years ago, it was like four or five years ago, 
my first son was only three and I was getting ready for my day. And it was just one of those days where you, you're kind of like feeling cute. You know, like you picked the right outfit, your hair is working out, your makeup ended up, you know, going well, all the girls know. And it's just like, I kind of feel cute today, you know? And I had been gifted these uh, false lashes and I'd never put them on before, but they they were just kind of hanging out in my drawer. We were getting ready to go out to dinner and I was like, I'm just gonna put them on. You know, it feels like the right occasion. And so I'm like getting the glue, trying not to poke my eye out and putting these lashes on. And I I finished and I loved it. I was like, man, these look really good. This is kind of fun. And I pick up my three-year-old and I put him on the counter and I'm I'm combing his hair so he's right at eye level with me. And my three-year-old son, he just stares at my eyes and he goes, mommy, what's that? And I said, what's what? And he grabs my lashes and he goes, what is that? And I said, they're just mommy's makeup. They're lashes. And he goes, I do not like those. And I was like, why? He goes, take them off, mommy. Take them off. And I was like, you can't tell me what to do as I'm taking them off, like turning around. (laughs) Never tried to put them on ever again. My three-year-old told me how to dress that day. But, but I, I try to dress for the day I want to have. This is what Esther did. She put on her royal robes and she gets ready to make the biggest decision of her entire life, risk her life, and she comes into the king's hall. She does something that, if you, haven't, if you haven't been here in the weeks past, was something that was punishable by death. Coming before the king unsummoned was an act that you could have been killed for. She decides to come before the king and she walks into the king's hall. Now this specific palace was called an apadana in Hebrew. And it was a hall that had, it was a, it was a, a huge, beautiful palace. And it was a hall that had 36 columns from the entrance of the hall to the king. These were 36 columns that were 65 feet tall, and they were known in history as some of the most airy and slender, intricate pillars ever to be made by human hands. Can you imagine the moment that she steps and she has to walk down this hall, and the king is sitting on his throne at the very, at the very back, And she walks all the way up. And the Bible says that as she walks, King Xerxes sees her. And what does verse two say? It says, when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her. This word pleased in the Hebrew means that she lifted up favor in his eyes. Esther was immediately met with favor. And then what we see in this incredible moment is King Xerxes extends his scepter to her symbolizing acceptance, symbolizing that she was allowed to come forward. And in that moment, he grants her two things. The first thing he grants her is mercy. He grants her mercy because instead of killing her, he accepts her to come forward because he was pleased with her. And the second thing that he grants her in extending his scepter is grace. Not only did he not kill her, But his response to her was, Esther, what is it that you need? Even up to half of my kingdom, I will give it to you. It's an incredible exchange where Esther's obedience is met with favor. And there's a couple of takeaways we can take from that exact moment. And the first one is this, is that Esther demonstrated meekness. Church, when we decide to, in moments of hardship or conflict, moments where we're deciding to stand up, when we demonstrate meekness in our life, I believe that we are met with the favor of God. What is meekness? Meekness is strength under control. See, Esther's people, they were praying and fasting. You have to believe that their impending death was making them emotional and and they were probably like freaking out. Mordecai was freaking out. He was weeping and wailing right outside the gate. He was like covered in mourning and and they were like all emotional. Esther demonstrates strength under control and makes the decision that she is going to go on behalf of everybody in her kingdom. What lesson is that for us? Man, it is important that we are not reckless in hardship, that we don't allow our emotions to consume us, but man, we ask God for his wisdom and for his strength so that we are able to walk through with discernment, following the voice of God. The second thing we take away from this exchange is that when we follow God's call, we can trust that the doors will open, that God's leading in our life will produce fruit. 
a lot of times it's like, man, how do I know that I'm following God's plan for our life? One of the things I always like to say is just honor God with your next yes. Say yes to the Lord and continue to walk through the doors that he opens for you. And as you step out in obedience, God will be faithful. God will produce fruit as you walk out in faith. We continue on in verse four through eight. And it says this, this is her words to the king as she's standing in front of him. She says, if it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now what is your petition? It will be given to you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and to fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. And so Esther makes a request to the king and she asks for a banquet. She wants Haman and the king to go. Now it wouldn't have been weird or out of the ordinary for Haman to be invited because he had just been promoted, remember in the chapter before. And there's a possibility that Esther wanted Haman to be there so that he would be present when she accused him. But one of the things that I thought through when I was reading the story is, why did Esther ask for a banquet? Why didn't she just ask the king what she wanted as soon as she was there? She's already been given the acceptance, right? Why risk a later date? Just tell him what you need right in the moment. Well, one of the things that I found as I was studying is that in that courtroom, in that king's hall, there would have been at any given moment at least 100 people in attendance. There were guards, there were soldiers, there were servants, there were house, I mean, there were just palace employees that were all around at that time. So this would have given Esther a chance to be in private where it was just the king and just Haman. But it was such a risk for her to ask for a delay. What do we learn here? Man, isn't it true that timing sometimes is everything? There are so many times with, with the best intentions, we do the right thing at the wrong time. And in this moment, Esther demonstrates wisdom and discernment because she, she's standing in front of the king and she's like, not here, not now. Come to a banquet and then I will tell you. And what we come to learn is she asks him to another banquet, what we just read, because the first banquet was not the right time. And I just have to be so admiring of her strength and her boldness and her courage to make this request, having no idea what the outcome would be or, or having no idea if King Xerxes would change his mind or change his mood. But in this moment, what she's doing is she's taking a step of faith. She's actively participating in God's plan for her life. When I was uh, in high school, I grew up in a really small town and I went to high school with most of uh, my cousins and friends and, and we, a lot of us were Christian. And so I was blessed to go to school with a big group of Christian friends and family. And my senior year, we were getting ready for our graduation ceremony and me and two other uh, friends who, they were cousins, extended cousins, got asked to sing a senior song. And instead of just picking a song, we wanted to write one. We wanted an original class song for 2008. And so we wrote it. And uh, in the song, because we were all believers, uh, the three of us, we decided that we were going to thank God in the lyrics of our song. And as we were writing our song, we also felt prompted that, man, after we sing, we should just like take a quick moment and pray at our graduation uh, since we'll be up there and bless our class and just thank the Lord for getting us here. The moment that our administration found out about it, they quickly came to us and they said, you will not sing about God in your song in any way, and you are not allowed to pray at graduation. And I remember, you know, these three senior girls were like looking at each other like, okay, what are we going to do? And it was like five seconds of talking back and forth before we decided that we felt like we needed to do it anyway. We talked to our parents. We talked to our pastor. Always seek wise counsel when you're going to make a decision like that. Uh, and we decided we were going to do it. I remember the feeling of my heart 
pounding in that moment as we are staring at bleachers full of people. Felt like our whole town was there and all of our class. And we kept the lyrics in our song. And then after it was over, one of us prayed in English, one of us prayed in Spanish. And I remember looking over at my principal and just the glare on his face as he's just staring at us. We did it. My heart probably pounded for the rest of that day and through the next morning when we received a phone call from our principal who asked us to come into the office. And he said, I'm withholding your diplomas because of what you guys did until you fulfill a certain amount of hours of community service. Uh, because you broke the rules. And uh, so, you know what we did? We grabbed our trash bag and we grabbed our stick and we did community service. And uh, after that was over, we finally received our diplomas. And it was a moment that I look back on where I could just, it was just one of those moments where I felt like, you know what, Lord, you called us to do something and we were obedient. And I think every one of us has to ask ourselves, in a way that might seem small like that, but oftentimes in much bigger ways. What are we willing to fight for in our life? What are the things that we're willing to take a risk on because we just feel this pounding in our heart that God is calling us to do something. He's calling us to act. He's calling us to step. What is it that we are willing to fight for in our lives? And could that be a prompting of the Holy Spirit for us to be used of God to do something powerful and something that will make a difference in, in, in the lives of those around us? This is exactly what Esther did. And as we read in verse five through eight, Esther has this first banquet, but she doesn't make her request there. She asks for another banquet. And commentators, uh, they, they believe, as I was reading commentary, uh, they suggested that maybe this was an act of the divine providence of God. Because in this moment, in this in-between, it allowed for a couple of things to happen. And one of those things was it allowed for Haman's immaturity and his pride to develop, right? He, he kind of became increasingly uh, mad. He became increasingly full of rage. He became increasingly prideful. And, and there were things that were happening in the middle of what seemed like a delay. Because can you imagine what the Jews must have felt like? Okay, Esther went before the king. She, surely she must have asked him. Okay, she's having a party. And she has the first party. Surely you asked him. And there's nothing. Okay, she's having another party, right? And it seems like there was this delay, but isn't it true that in the middle of all of those delays, God was working behind the scenes in ways that Esther didn't even realize. And we're about to find out one of those ways as we uh, continue to read verse nine through 14, which is the end of our chapter. Uh, it says this, Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she's invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all of this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Haman, that Jew Mordecai, sorry, sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all of his friends said to him, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. Verse nine tells us that when Mordecai saw Haman, he stayed down and he refused to stand. Not only that, it says that he showed no fear in Haman's presence. See, I believe that as Mordecai was watching Esther step out in boldness, it gave him boldness as well. And he didn't show fear in Haman's presence. And Haman goes home and he's boasting. And what does he say? There's a very, very important phrase that is shared in that scripture. It says in verse 13, 
But all of this, my wives, my, my wife, my kids, my wealth, um, the fact that I got invited to this party. I mean, he is like, he's in high spirit, so he's a little inebriated, right? And he is like high on life. And he says, all of this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew showing no fear in my presence. And you've got to ask yourself, why did Haman hate the Jews so much? What was it that gave him this, this consuming rage for Mordecai? Well, if we take a step back, we, we always try to find moments in our messages and when we're teaching God's word to show us that God's word is connected. It, it is a story that starts at the beginning and goes all the way through. And if we take a step back, we will begin to understand that Haman's hatred for the Jews was not something that just started with him. It was a family hatred. It was a hatred that ran deep for Haman. It was something that ran in the family. How many of us have things that just run in our family? Tendencies, preferences, uh, sports teams we either hate uh, or love, right? Because our family likes or dislikes them. Uh, we, when I was growing up, we were a Chevy family, okay? Chevy vehicles, that was that we, that's the kind of family that we were. My grandpa owned Chevys. My mom's dad, my other grandpa owned Chevys. My dad only ever owned Chevys. And it wasn't just a love for Chevys. It was a love for Chevys and a disdain for Fords. Okay, it was like you, you were one or you were the other. Now I realize I'm about to deeply offend our Ford lovers here today. But growing up, this is all I knew is that Ford was an acronym that stood for found on the road dead. Okay, that's all I knew. And, and I understand that they're really pretty and that they probably run really well. I just, I cannot like them. It's just, it's embedded in my DNA, right? My, my dad didn't own them. And then I got married and Manny happened to be a Chevy guy. And the other day, my kids were talking about what, because they're boys, about what kind of truck they're going to own one day at seven and four. And, and my oldest son said, what if I bought an F-150? And before I could even realize what was coming out of my mouth, I said, we don't buy Fords in this family. <laughs> and he's like, mom, like what's wrong with them? And we just don't buy Fords. You can buy a Chevy, you can buy a Toyota, maybe a Dodge, you cannot buy a Ford, period. Don't bring it onto our property, right? It's just this thing. I don't even know why. I've, I don't even think I've ever ridden in a Ford. I just, I, my dad didn't like them. My grandpa didn't like them. So I don't like them. It ran in the family. This hatred for, for the Jews ran in Haman's family. How do we know this? If we go back all the way to 1 Samuel chapter 15, there is an interaction that takes place. King Saul is commanded by God to wipe out a group of corrupt and evil, wicked people. And those were the Amalekites. And what we know is that King Saul does not follow through on this command completely. And he leaves some of the Amalekites behind. Now, 500 years later, Haman walks on the scene. And the Bible says that Haman was the son of of an Agagite, of King Agag. And who was King Agag? He was an Amalekite. The Amalekites were sworn enemies of the Jews. So now you fast forward 500 years and the Jews are living in exile in Persia and Haman is there and he has this deep hatred that has come from generation to generation that has been passed down to him. And, and they had one thing in mind and that was find a way to wipe out the Jews. This was a result of the disobedience from King Saul. And it became a generational curse for Haman. No matter what, he was going to hate the Jews. And, and I want to ask us today, as we look in our own life, in our own pasts, what are the things that have been passed down to us? What are the things that we carry? What are the, the, what are the places of anger and bitterness or resentment? Well, what are the addictions? What's the sin? What is the weight that we have carried that has been passed down to us from our families and our ancestors or the places and experiences that we grew up in? I believe that there are some of us who we, we live under the shadow and under the weight of that. The Bible says that when it comes to, to generations after generations, we have the opportunity to choose blessing or cursing. And, and our opportunity to choose blessing or cursing look very different according to the Bible than it does to the world. 
Because the way that the world looks at generational curses or blessing is this. Did you know that statistically, there is a like father, like son mentality in our culture, in our society, that they can predict that if there was an absent parent in the home, a child is five times more likely to be an absent parent themselves. That if there's a child who grew up in a family of addiction, they are more likely to end up as an addict themselves than a child who did not grow up in the family of an addict. That those who uh, grew up with an incarcerated mom or a dad or a, a family member are much more likely to end up incarcerated. Why? Because there is this stigma that you get what's handed down to you. And I don't know why I am the way I am. That's just the way I was raised. It's just the way that, that I was wired. It's the way that I was made. And these are the cards that were dealt to me. And this is what I have to deal with. And you know what? The Bible sets us free from that, church. I want to encourage you, if you feel stuck in, in, in a generational weight that you've been living under, a, a characteristic, a trait, you are bitter, you, you have anger, you have rage, and you don't know why, but you remember your dad and your grandpa and your uncles or, or someone significant in your life, the Bible sets us free and it allows us to break the chains of inherited guilt in our life and throw them off. If that is you and you are struggling with that today, I wanna to encourage you to read Ezekiel chapter 18. Read that entire chapter because it will set you free from the burden of that. I wanna read verse 20 in Ezekiel 18 and it says this, the one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. I think some of us need to hear that and receive that this morning. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. What does Deuteronomy 30, 19 say about our ability to choose blessing or cursing in our life? It says this, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you are a first-generation Christian and you're here in this room, you have the opportunity to change the path of the generations who will come after you by taking a step of faith and actively participating in God's mission for your life. Haman is consumed with hatred and he's also consumed with pride. We see this pride as, he, as his arrogance and his boasting gets the very best of him. And, and, and verse 10 through 14 teach us a couple of things as I wanna close today. And the first thing is this, be careful the company that you keep. Haman surrounded himself with friends and family who, who spoke into his life and, and told him to build a gallow, a pole, for Mordecai that was 50 cubits high. Instead of saying, hey, hey, Haman, you need to like, you need to check yourself, you need to settle down, it's not a big deal. What did they do? Man, they just, they egged him on. 50 cubits would have been higher than any other building in that city. And in a very, very twi like significant twist of fate, Haman's life is about to go a completely direction than what he thought. Be careful the company that you keep because they can either speak life or death into your life. The second thing is this, if Satan can distract you, he will deter you from God's best. Haman became so consumed with rage, he became so consumed with building this pole for Mordecai that he became completely deterred from anything that could have gone differently in his life and his fate became sealed because of the decisions that he made. A lot of times, there won't be something big or significant in our life that will lead us down the wrong path, but there will be distraction after distraction that will keep us off of focus from the mission that God has for you and for me. The Jews needed saving and Esther was there and she was going to be used of God to work on their behalf and boldly come before the king. I think it's so encouraging for us, church, as we read this story, to see God using ordinary people to bring his plan to pass. Because how many of us know that we serve a God who can do the supernatural and the impossible? In a moment's notice, he can part the Red Sea. 
He can rain down manna from heaven. He can heal the sick in an instant. But how many of us know that as we read God's word and as we experience life on this earth, what we see is that most of the time, God works through his people to accomplish his mission. He could have saved the Jews by some supernatural act, but he used Esther to do it. And the challenge for us today is how does God want to use us to bring about his purposes on this earth? I believe that there are some of us who God has given us dreams. He's given us a vision. He's given us an idea and he's placed it in our heart. Church, when the Holy Spirit drops something in our heart, that is the Lord giving us an opportunity to do it. I heard it said not too long ago in a message. Sometimes we're waiting to see if God calls us to do something, if there's a green light to be able to do it. And the pastor said, if it's in God's word, you can almost bet that he's asking you to do it. Go and do it. Go for it. I'm so inspired by that missionary family who's sitting on the front row of a service as pastors of a church with children who felt prompted because their heart broke for something. And then the Lord acted on their behalf and spoke to their daughter and spoke to different members of their family. And what did they do? Man, they're taking a step forward and they're going. In what ways does God want you to go? In what ways does he want to challenge you? Does he want to use you to accomplish his purposes and make a difference in this world? I want to encourage us to bow our heads this morning because I have been praying that the Lord would just drop something in our hearts today that we would burn for passion, that we would feel compelled to be the hands and feet of God. Maybe it's a conversation that you need to have with somebody you see every day at work. Maybe it's, it's a charity or an organization that you need to start because you feel a need and you feel the burden of a hurt in your community. Maybe God's calling you to missions. Maybe he's calling you to move and to go and to be used of him. Maybe he's calling you to adopt or he's calling you to foster. He's calling you to care for a group of people you've never felt burdened to care about. Don't ignore the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because the way in which God moves oftentimes is through the hands and feet of his people. So God, we want to be sensitive to how you're calling us to take a step of faith this morning. God, I pray for every single person right now who you are dropping and depositing an idea, a conversation, a message, a phone call, a step that needs to take place to be used to fulfill the mission that you have on our lives. God, I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of your word. God, I pray that we would steward our time on this earth with everything that we have to be used to make a lasting impact for you. God, I pray for those of us who walked in here today carrying the weight of family and of generational cursing. God, of, of brokenness, of bitterness, of disappointment, of discouragement. God, you have come to make our burden light. And I pray that we would choose life and we would choose blessing. God, I pray for boldness and for wisdom for those of us who have the opportunity to start a new pattern for our families and our life. I pray that we would feel the freedom that we have to break the chains of inherited guilt and inherited heaviness and that we would walk in the freedom that you purchased for every single one of us on the cross. God, I pray for those who are here today who do not have a relationship with you if that is you and you are in this place and you are, you are looking for a savior, can I tell you that you have come to the right place? Jesus, he loves you. He created you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has things that he wants you to do. He has purpose for you. And if that's you today or you're watching online, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, come into my heart. Change my life. Make me new. I want a relationship with you. Jesus, help me to walk with you, to learn to walk with you. Thank you that you love me. 
Thank you that you died for me and that I can find freedom in you. Jesus, I pray that you would compel every single one of us to respond according to your plans and your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, we're so grateful that you came to church today. And I wanna encourage you, man, if the Lord drops something in your heart, share it with somebody and, and have that accountability so that we're able to make a difference together, amen.